So hello everyone. Last time we started talking about the modeling of time dependent problems, which means the materials uh, which have uh, time dependency like viscosity. We introduced uh, some phenomenological uh, material behavior, and then uh, we constructed some uh, some rheological model to describe different behaviors like linear elasticity, nonlinear elasticity, viscosity, and plasticity. And then we talked about the solution of Maxwell device, which consists of a spring and a dashboard in series, and this describes the uh, like typical behavior of viscous fluid. Uh, today we will continue with this and we will address the Kelvin model, which consists of spring and a dashboard in, in Bardiel, and this represents a typical solid uh, material behavior when it's uh, viscous. And then we will move to a more general model, which is the pointing thompson model, which is uh, more general for the uh, description of <coughs> viscoelastic material behavior. And this formulation will give us ordinary differential equation, which will uh, be a part of the last section, which is the numerical integration of ordinary differential equation. So uh, this is the uh, typical Kelvin device. <clears throat> As I said, it consists of a spring and a, a dashboard in, in, uh, in Berlin. And uh, to describe the response of this, we start by the kinematics. So uh, the strain, as you see, in the elastic branch and the viscous branch are equal, which is epsilon, so the total uh, like strain of our model. If we look at the equilibrium, we see that if we apply stress, it would be distributed uh, into the two branches. So we have the elastic uh, stress and the inelastic stress, which is representing, in this case, of course, the viscosity. And this is a second equation. And then we have the constitutive relations, which, which are the um, uh, like the Hookean elasticity law for the uh, uh, like for the spring branch, and then we have the uh, like the stress and strain rate relationship, which is connected uh, with the viscous uh, element. Now, uh, if we insert the uh, two constitutive relations, which are marked by equation number three, we, ins we insert them into equation number two, and then we end up with this. Uh, equation here, which include only the total strain and the total stress, which is a differential equation, uh, which uh, which is connected also to Kelvin device. So uh, this is a differential equation with respect to the strain uh, or the uh, strain rate. So it's a differential equation in time. And uh, it can be uh, solved if we have like some uh, initial condition like given stress function. Let's, let's uh, have an example for this. So for an example, consider the uh, creep test, which is carried out by applying a sudden load or stress. So the creep is an output. It means that we are applying stress as an input. In this case, our stress function will look like this. First, uh, we have no stress. And then we suddenly, we give a step-wise uh, stress, which is sigma 0. So at t equal to t0, we give this, uh, this uh, step. And then we keep the stress constant. And uh, as the stress is our input, then the, the strain would be our output. Let's plug this uh, condition into our uh, equation. Then we will have epsilon dot plus e uh, divided by eta multiplied by epsilon. Then this is equals to 1 to eta uh, multiplied by sigma 0. So we have a constant stress. Now, uh, as we did uh, previously for uh, like Maxwell model, we can go exactly the same way. We propose a function as a solution with constants. And then, well, then we have to determine these constants based on the uh, conditions that we have. Uh, if, if we apply sudden stress, then initially the strain is equal to zero because the behavior uh, or for the strain to, de to develop, we need to have deformation in the dashboard. And this is um, this will not happen uh, like uh, instantly. It will require some time. Therefore, epsilon equal to zero for t equal to zero. Based on this condition, the solution of our strain function will, will be look like this. It's of course a function of time. So time is the only variable. It includes the material bar uh, material parameters, uh, as you see here. So uh, let's plot this function. Uh, by the time, so when the time increases from zero to some kind uh, of infinity, then the strain will converge to a certain value, which is uh, sigma zero to epsilon. So the exponential of minus t, so the t will be my, uh, will be infinity, then we'll be, we will have one divided by infinity, it will be zero. What remains is sigma zero divided by e. Now for t equal to zero, then the exponential uh, function is uh, exponential of zero will be one, and then the strain will be zero. 
And this is a typical creep response in our uh, in the modeling. Now, uh, as we have seen, the uh, Maxwell model alone, it can describe the relaxation behavior and the Kelvin model alone can describe the, uh, uh, like the creep behavior. Now we, we have uh, another model, which is the pointing Thompson model, it's more advanced and it, it is, uh, it's capable of describing both the relaxation and the creep uh, material response. So let's talk a little bit about the covering equation of the viscoelastic uh, pointing Thompson model. Um, it consists of, of two branches. We have the uh, elastic branch, which is, uh, as you see here, it's E0, it, it's a spring with uh, this stiffness. And then we have non-equilibrium branch, which has a spring and a dashboard. Uh, the uh, material parameters, as you see here, uh, yeah, they, they change depending on the material which we are considering uh, as usual, so which comes from the experimental data. And then we have these two branches, which is the equilibrium here, which is uh, the only remaining uh, branch which is activated if we have, if we wait for long, for a long time and we have fully relaxed uh, response. Uh, when you apply some load or some strain, uh, both branches will uh, deform because they have both springs. Uh, but the non-equilibrium branch uh, will, uh, uh, if we wait for a long time, for instance, for relaxation, then the dashboard will expand and then there will be no more stresses in this branch. Uh, now, if we want to describe the kinematics, it's clear that the total strain in the non-equilibrium uh, branch equals to the sum of the inelastic strain and the, in, the elastic strain. Then we take the time derivative because this will be needed later. Uh, for the equilibrium, it's clear the total stress will be then the sum of the equilibrium uh, stress and the non-equilibrium stress. These are, uh, this is equation number three. And then we have the constitutive relation, which is, which is uh, for both. For instance, for the equilibrium branch, we have uh, sigma equilibrium equals to E0 multiplied by, uh, by epsilon, so the total strain. And then we have the sigma non-equilibrium, which is the for the spring will be then sigma elastic equals to E1 multiplied by uh, epsilon elastic. And then for the non-equilibrium uh, or sorry, for the inelastic or for the viscous uh, element, then you have sigma inelastic equals to D1 multiplied by epsilon I uh, dot. So it's the rate of the inelastic strain. And it's clear that the sigma elastic and sigma inelastic are equal because we have uh, the uh, spring and the dashboard in, in series in the non-equilibrium branch. So starting from this uh, relationship, we see that uh, we just block the constitutive equation then we have epsilon inelastic equals to uh, um, in, in here. So it's equals to E1 divided by D1 multiplied by epsilon minus epsilon inelastic because this is exactly the epsilon elastic. So this is uh, clear, it's a differential uh, equation because it, it includes also the time derivative here. And um, uh, we could have also an initial state, for instance, uh, if we, uh, we have a t equal to zero at the initial time, then we could have like epsilon zero. Uh, so as I said, the later equation represents a first order ordinary differential equation because we have only one time derivative it is of the form y uh, dot equals to f t y, with this as the initial state, and we need to find uh, or to figure out a suitable uh, time integration scheme uh, for this kind of equations, and this would be the topic for the next few slides. So the topic is how uh, can we integrate numerically a first order ordinary differential equation. Uh, which has this form, so y dot equals to dy to dt, which is a function of y and t, with this initial condition. So the first step in the numerical time integration is to apply uh, discretization in time. So we discretize our time axis into uh, like n, um, like n uh, time step. And we assume that the uh, time step or the distance between two uh, consequence time steps is delta t. So delta t is tk plus one minus tk. Now, um, uh, we distinguish in, in general, uh, in the context of time discretization between two classes of time steppings. 
which are the uh, one-step methods, which uh, by definition, it makes use of the information at one uh, previous time step to determine the current uh, values. Uh, there are like uh, typical examples, which are the implicit or backward Euler, then we have the explicit or forward Euler, and uh, we have also the trapezoidal rule as a, like typical examples. Then we have multi-step methods, uh, which store and use the values from previous uh, time steps of several previous, more than one. A typical example would be here, the second order uh, backward differentiation formula, or uh, as an abbreviation would be the BDF2. And this is the example or the method which is applied in the uh, software FlexBD, which you are using in the exercises. Now, um, uh, as I said, there are several time integration schemes. So it's uh, the user's choice, which uh, times time integration scheme to be used. And this is a trade off between stability, accuracy, and uh, of course, computational uh, cost. Uh, let's consider, for instance, the explicit or for, uh, forward uh, Euler. So uh, how we proceed with this, we apply a Taylor series to linearize the function. So we have this is a function, we linearize this around the uh, time step TK, which is the known time step. So this is how usually we uh, derive this uh, time integration scheme. So our function Y uh, as a function of TK plus one equals to Y at TK. So the values at this time point uh, equals, to, uh, uh, equals to the value at the previous time plus the derivation of the function y with respect to the time at t equals to tk. This is nothing uh, but the uh, y dot at tk, which is our function uh, yk and tk, and then multiplied by tk plus one minus tk plus a higher order term. So uh, this, is, uh, the, this represents the linearization uh, error. Now, if we neglect the higher order term, and uh, this will give us the explicit or forward Euler relationship, which is this, uh, this formulation here. And uh, because we divided uh, everything by delta t, then the error will be uh, delta t here. So instead of delta t square, and this is uh, what we call the trunc uh, truncation error. Now, uh, alternatively, we can go for the implicit or backward uh, Euler. So later I will uh, give a conversion between these schemes. Uh, in this case, we apply also the Taylor series uh, to linearize the function around the uh, uh, around the uh, like uh, current time step, so around tk plus one. So in this case, our y tk, which is our function at the previous time step, equals to the value of the function at the next time step plus uh, the derivation of the function with respect to the time at t equals to tk plus one. This is nothing but our function f y k plus one uh, and uh, and also t k plus one multiplied by t k minus uh, t k plus one, which is minus delta t plus the higher order uh, term, which comes from the linearization. Again, this is the error uh, coming from the linearization. Now, uh, if we reformulate this equation and uh, we put it in a like, comparable, comparable way, like in the, uh, in the explicit Euler, then we have yk plus one minus yk divided by delta t. And this is equals to a function of yk plus one, uh, comma tk plus one and plus uh, o delta t, which is the error. So the truncation error, it's now delta t and previously we had delta t squared simply because we divided everything by uh, delta t. As I said, this represents the implicit or backward Euler. It's implicit because we have here yk plus one and we have inside the function also yk plus one. So this is a nonlinear uh, equation. Whereas uh, uh, previously in the explicit, we had yk plus one only on the left-hand side. So it is an explicit scheme in this case. Uh, there are, like, as I said, several schemes, for instance, the crank nicholson or what's called the trapezoidal uh, rule. It uh, takes the average of the implicit and the explicit Euler. And as we see here, uh, from the left-hand side, we have always exactly the same term. From the right-hand side, it depends if we have implicit or explicit. So in this trapezoidal rule, we have the function at the previous time step and the uh, function at the uh, current time step. So uh, it's considered also an implicit because this is uh, this needs also to be linearized. 
Uh, let's say, um, how can we decide which one is better for our problem? Uh, by applying some conversion. So uh, if we look at the discretization error, uh, now we are comparing between uh, implicit and explicit Euler. So the order of discretization errors for both is uh, of second order, so delta t square. So they have the same order of discretization error or linearization, let's say. Then we have the local truncation error. We have seen that both have the same order of truncation error. So truncation error represents the difference between the exact and the discrete solution. So from the accuracy point of, uh, uh, of view, both scheme has exactly the same error. Uh, for the implementation, uh, as I said, the implicit schemes result in a nonlinear equation. So they need also a, a next step, which is linearization. So from computational point of view, uh, with regard, of course, to the linearization, they are uh, computationally more expensive. Now, uh, if you look at the stability, uh, this is another uh, issue. So, so stability is a very big domain and uh, it can be proved like mathematically. So we have different types of stability, A stability, L stability, and so on. But this is beyond the, scale, the scope of our uh, lecture. So for explicit or forward Euler, we have uh, uh, like a critical time step. So this is, uh, this is really well, well known if you have an uh, explicit solution. We have a critical time step. If we uh, go above this critical time step, then the solution will not converge. And uh, so we, have, we need to use a small time step. So from this perspective, it's, uh, uh, it's computationally more expensive because you always need a small time step. And uh, this does not um, exist in implicit schemes. Uh, and uh, however, uh, there are like a lot of issues in this regard. So if you are solving a dynamic problem with like cyclic loading, then you will need anyhow a small time step to, to capture the loading, for instance. And this needed time step, uh, it might be smaller than your critical time step. So uh, one goes for explicit uh, schemes. And this is what you see, uh, for instance, if you are uh, Abacus users, you have Abacus um, explicit, it's mainly for dynamic problems. Uh, but if you have uh, small processes, uh, like which it takes like, I don't know, consolidation of soil, or you have occurrence of plasticity under static loadings and so, and so on, or quite static loading, then these processes uh, like occur over a long time. In this case, you can choose a higher time step and might be the implicit is more uh, efficient. And then we have um, also another problem, which is dynamic, uh, which is damping. This is happens uh, if, you are, if you are applying, for instance, the implicit Euler. And uh, in, this, in this case, we have um, uh, like stable solution. So you have nice conversions and everything looks fine. However, uh, the solution is not accurate. Uh, and uh, this can be figured out if you test the time step. So if you get a step, uh, stable solution for a certain time step, then change the time step for a smaller one, for instance. Then if you don't get the same uh, stable solution, maybe you'll get another stable solution, but with some errors, it means that you have this dumping. Usually if we choose a sufficiently small time step, then you will not have like significant dumping. Otherwise, uh, it's a dangerous uh, issue because it might give you uh, like the wrong solution without any signal of, of stability. Uh, now, uh, just a small remark regarding the uh, like multi-step schemes with like the backward differential formula. So this, is, uh, this can be seen as a class. So BDF is a family of implicit methods for numerical integration of ordinary differential equations. It can be written in this general uh, formulation here. So the sum of uh, like e k y n plus k uh, equals to delta t is the time step multiplied by beta uh, and f uh, y n plus, uh, plus s comma t n plus s. So we vary the values of s, uh, b, and a depending on the scheme that you are applying. For instance, if we choose s equal uh, to one in, in this uh, this regard, and uh, you choose like uh, beta uh, equals to like one, then you will have exactly the uh, backward uh, or endless Euler, which is a BDF one. So it's a backward uh, differential formulation of first order. Uh, for other choices, if we take s equal to two, then we go for like second order backward differential of, uh, differentiation uh, formula. 
which is uh, one which is found in the FlexBD code, uh, which is used in your uh, in the exercises. In this case, to compute uh, yn plus two, then we need information from two previous time steps, namely from tn plus one and tn, because we have here yn plus one and yn. So it's from computational point of view, it's more expensive because we need to store uh, more values from the time, from previous time steps. However, it has some advantages like more stability and more accuracy. So uh, as I said before, it's a trade-off. I will uh, give an example from my own research work. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, two-dimensional uh, domain. It's an uh, initial bounded value problem. Uh, it's in the context of Bohr's media, but uh, like forget about this. Consider that we have elastic or linear elastic domain. And then we have a load above here. So it's a step load. So it increases and then uh, decreases to zero. And we are looking at the dynamic behavior, uh, namely the uh, wave propagation. So therefore, we are looking at the deformation at point A at the, uh, at the top of the domain. And as I said, it's sports media. So we are looking also at the pressure inside the domain. Uh, it's Bohr's media, it includes fluid as, a, as a, um, like one of the phases and a solid skeleton. And uh, we are looking also at the wave propagation uh, at the surface where then we have a relay waves, so there are R waves. In the domain, then we have pressure waves and shear waves. Uh, we solve this problem using different time integration schemes just to compare what is the effect of using implicit and explicit. Uh, this is a uh, this is a video which shows the. Uh, yeah, sorry. It, okay, it's, it's not working, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I will show it in the in the lecture. So it shows how the uh, wave uh, propagate inside the inside the uh, domain. Uh, anyhow, if we if we look at the uh, um, if we compare between the implicit uh, uh, solutions scheme which we are using, for instance, here, uh, we see that. Uh, the uh, second order backward difference formula with trapezoidal rule, they uh, like give exactly the same results, which, uh, which is our, uh, in our assumption, we have convergence to the exact solution. Whereas the backward Euler or the implicit Euler, it shows some damping behavior. This is the issue that I talked about. So the green line uh, is the uh, implicit Euler for a time step of 10 to the power uh, minus uh, three. Now, if we divide the time step by two, so we take a smaller time step, then we have the red line, so we are getting closer to the uh, correct solution. And this is what uh, I said. So uh, we need to choose a sufficiently small time step to get rid of the uh, negative effect of the dumping. And then we have, this is the, the pressure uh, trajectory. So it shows that uh, uh, like several schemes uh, or TR and TR BDF2, TR is a trapezoidal rule, it's uh, less expensive. Still, for the pressure uh, uh, field, it's, it gives us exactly the same solution with some stability problems. So, uh, but it, it was acceptable in our case. Uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so with this, I'm at, at the end of this uh, video. Then we will meet at, on Monday for uh, the lecture. Until then, I wish you a happy week. Thank you.